Welcome to Whittle on the UK Biobank Research Analysis Platform. This is part one of two. Um, as Brenton mentioned, there'll be a more advanced topic next um, for the next session. So my name is Ted Ladaris. I'm a principal scientist and bioinformatics trainer at DNA Nexus. And my colleague is... Anastasia Sedlakova, and I'm a senior community engagement scientist focused on UK Biobank. Great. Thanks. Um, so this is our, our agenda for um, the session. <clears throat> Excuse me. So talking about kind of, you know, what is the use case of Whittle, we'll talk about um, an introduction to Whittle and how it works with the DX compiler on our platform to make native uh, apps and workflows. Um, we'll talk about the entire compilation process. Um, and then we will dive into Whittle structure and syntax in detail. So let's talk about the learning objectives for the session. So number one, list the advantages of Whittle apps and workflows. Two, utilize DX compiler to run workflows. Three, define data types and basic Whittle syntax and write tasks and workflows using Whittle libraries um, and the built-in resources. So there, we also have learning objectives for part two. So we're not going to cover these ones, but they will be in part two. Uh, refine workflows with metadata, compute dynamic resource requirements, integrate the use of containers into workflows, and then create a Docker image from scratch. So just a quick uh, reminder, uh, we did send out, like when we sent out the invitations for the seminar that we did suggest that you review these three uh, sessions, um, uh, basically the overview, building uh, native apps and workflows on the platform, and then using the command line. Um, additionally, um, it really is helpful if you have a familiarity with developing um, bioinformatics workflows and pipelines, at least some of the basic terminology. Um, and it sounds like most everyone is profit, proficient in either Bash, Python, or R, which is great. Um, and then having some familiarity with Docker or similar other container technologies. So just, um, just kind of as a quick, quick review and overview, Remember that UKB RAP is much more than just kind of access to high performance computing. Um, in the overall scheme of things, you know, we do have the web browser UI, um, which includes both running apps um, at the, on the user interface, but also a cohort browser for exploration of cohorts. Um, we have the command line tools. Um, uh, what we're going to be focusing on are the portable tools, um, which mean what we mean by portable is that if you basically write it once, you'll be able to run it in a variety of different environments. Um, this includes what we're going to be talking about today, which is Whittle workflow description language, um, uh, also CWL and Docker are supported. Um, and then finally, there are the number of language bindings um, that you can kind of utilize. Uh, for Bash, Python, um, et cetera. So again, you know, when you have uh, started a UK biobank project, I mean, part of the reason it's set up the way it is, is that the data is dispensed to you securely. <coughs> you have a large variety of um, bioinformatics tools that are already kind of available to you. That previous session with apps and workflows, we talked about how you can bring your own tools onto the platform, and it is you're available, uh, you're able to use your own favorite language to interact with the platform, whether it be Python, R, Stata, or Bash. So we do want to encourage you to participate in, sur in surveys because you do it does inform what um, we cover for future topics. So we do really encourage you to um, really uh, give us feedback. If there are holes in your knowledge that you want us to fill in, we want to help you learn that. Um, we're also um, looking into uh, setting up user groups. So we're interested in you know, whether you'd like to be part of the user group, um, specifically our users and HPC users. Um, so, uh, you know, there be, will be individual user groups for these, these kinds of interests. 
So if you're interested, uh, please fill in the form. Brenton will send um, the, the feedback form in the webinar and you can note your interest in that, um, or we will also send it after the webinar. So let's talk about um, kind of general workflows and how, how you can basically run them on the platform. So if you have a workflow that's written in um, WDL or Whittle, um, you can basically utilize our utility called DX Compiler, and it will basically be compiled into both um, a set of apps and an associated native workflow. Uh, similarly, um, if you have uh, a workflow in CWL, this, the path is identical. Um, one thing to note is if you are using NextFlow workflow, um, you can run it um, from like, you can run like, you know, a single node instance uh, that is, uh, from a cloud workstation, TTYD or JupyterLab. Um, but if you need to use it at scale, you do need to have a license um, to utilize it on the platform. Um, finally, uh, if you have just like a Python uh, bash or R script that you want to run on the platform, uh, you can create an applet. And again, you know, the applets let you kind of modularize your different tasks and, you know, we can reuse them using workflows. Uh, just a quick review of apps and workflows on the platform. <clears throat> we talked about last, uh, last session, we talked about native applets and apps. Uh, these are mostly written in Bash or Python. And then you customize the configuration um, using this uh, JSON file called dxapp.json. Um, and then we covered a lot of the different kinds of ways to kind of manage software dependencies for uh, your your um, your your particular um, your particular app, including Docker images. Um, so the next level up is are the native workflows, and so native workflows essentially let you string um, applets or apps together in sequence, and these can be basically built uh, via the UI. Um, there is a nice kind of workflow builder in the UI or you can um, edit this dxworkflow.json file by hand. Um, finally, Whittle workflows, um, we'll be covering this um, again and again, but they're compiled, um, they're compiled to native apps and workflows using the DX compiler, um, which is a Java-based tool. Um, to, uh, and we will be going through how everything maps together uh, from a Whittle workflow to a native workflow. Um, dependencies are specified as Docker images, and we want to point you to the related webinar recording and slides. <clears throat> so let's just, just for those who, who aren't familiar with Whittle, um, it, uh, it is short for workflow description language, and it lets you specify data processing workflows with human readable and writable syntax. Um, if you want to know more about the Whittle format, we point we want to point you out to the specification here at this GitHub repository. Um, to again to run Whittle workflows on our platform, uh, you utilize DX compiler first. But um, again, part of the reason why you write Whittle is that it is portable. Like you can basically write one Whittle uh, one Whittle. Um, script and basically execute it on your local machine. And you can utilize a, a tool such as Cromwell that will let you run it locally or on your um, HPC. HPC. Um, and then there's also mini Whittle, which will also let you run it lo locally. So the, ver the version uh, that we utilize on the platform is 1.1. Just so just please keep that in mind. Um, again, so let's just uh, some of the advantages of Whittle's tasks and workflows is that they are able to be executed in any environment that we just talked about. Um, a lot of that, uh, the issues uh, with kind of getting files to and from the platform, that's involved, that's basically kind of handled um, uh, with DX compiler, such as downloading or uploading files and then getting your Docker image into, into the actual worker. 
Um, your resource requirements can be evaluated dynamically. So um, if there is, you know, a stage in your process doesn't require a lot of workers or less um, CPUs um, or cores, you can basically kind of manage that at, at that individual um, task level. And, you know, of course, you know, once you've written it, you can share it and other people can utilize it. So we can't cover all of the, all of Whittle today, but we do want to point you to like sources. Um, one of the best ones is this learn dash Whittle uh, uh, link here. Um, we really like this. Um, and then if you want to look at kind of example, uh, Whittle files, Doc Store especially is great. Um, it's bioinformatics focused and has a bunch of Whittle uh, workflows there. And also here, if you're interested in using genome analysis toolkits, there are a number of Whittles, there are Whittle workflows here. So let's talk about the, how, how you run Whittle on RAP. So let's kind of contrast. Um, we talked about last time about kind of the development cycle for native workflows. Um, so let's contrast it with how it works in Whittle. So on the native workflows, you really are creating those individual stages of your workflow um, initially by creating applets. Um, here we start with, uh, for Whittle, we start with the package dependencies, including doc, uh, and we use manage that with Docker. Um, to build our applets on the platform, we use DX Toolkit. And then to create the workflow, we can basically use the UI workflow builder, or we can use uh, edit that DX workflow.json to string the app applets or apps together. So what happens when you find an error? Oh, and for uh, Whittle, uh, essentially, what you're doing is you are creating both the individual tasks or steps and the workflow at once in the same document. So let's talk about what happens when you find an error. Um, one of the issues here with um, with working with um, you know the native workflows is that the debugging process you have to actually debug the individual steps at the applet level and then basically kind of uh, go through the process again. Um, with Whittle, uh, like I said, the tasks and workflow are in the same kind of document. And so the debugging process is a little simpler um, because it's, you know, you don't have to kind of dive into each of the individual applets. So hopefully if you don't find an error, um, uh, basically, the next step for Whittle is to build the workflow with DX compiler, and then you will have a pro uh, production level workflow that's that will be now available to you on the platform for either either development uh, uh, cycles. So when you're getting started, um, you know a lot of this, you know, is you you will be doing a lot of interactive testing of your Whittle code. So we wanna point out some resources on the platform that basically lets you um, kind of debug your, your Whittle code um, in an interactive session. So um, we encourage you like to utilize the TTYD app. So this basically will open a web terminal for a worker on the platform. Um, and you can, uh, if you need to work with large files, uh, this is our recommendation for the instance type here. Um, you can download your test files uh, using DX download. Um, in general, like, you know, you might want, you want to start with a kind of a smaller batch of files and kind of test it before you kind of try it with a larger batch of files. So start with a smaller, smaller uh, subset of files. Um, to, uh, so once, uh, if you've generated your uh, Whittle file, you can download WOM tool. And with this command here, um, you can use it to basically extract um, extract the inputs required inputs as a JSON file, um, and then you can fill that out with like the relevant details um, of your testing, and then you can um, basically download and use Cromwell uh, to run that Whittle file um, in interactively in the 
well, not really interactively. It, it will let you run the WIDL file within the worker. And then you can provide a use, fill out that input.json file and uh, use it as an argument with his stash dash inputs argument. So um, with the Whittle workflows, again, it is a two-step uh, two process. Um, again, the first step is the compilation process. And what happens is that your Whittle basically co gets compiled, compiled into two different things. Um, like your individual uh, tasks get compiled to applets, and then your workflow gets translated into a DNA, nex DNA Nexus native workflow. Um, you'll, and it will return a workflow ID that you can use uh, to refer to that workflow. Then you can run the, the compiled workflow with inputs um, with DX run. And so let's dive deeper into each of these steps so you're familiar with what's going on. So this is kind of the first, the command that you're going to use to kick off the first one. This seems like it's a lot, but we're going to go through each of, the, uh, this each of these kind of bits of this command individually. So the first thing is that um, you're going to need your to uh, initiate DX compiler. Um, it is available as this jar file or a Java archive file. So you're going sorry, you're going to initialize it using Java and then the dash jar argument, uh, followed by the name of the uh, and then you need to follow it with uh, the compile uh, directive and then give the whittle file. So just reading this, um, you know, Java dash jar DX compiler, which is our jar file. And then we need to provide this compile command and then the name of, of our widow file. Um, if you have inputs uh, that you've kind of put in a JSON file, again, you can use the dash dash inputs to, to um, basically use that at, to specify your inputs for your workflow. Um, and so let's kind of talk about that kind of file. So this is this is kind of the um, this this is a, the kind of JSON file that comes from basically uh, using the WOM tools and extracting that input file. Um, you can see that um, you know each of the steps or each of the tasks and inputs are specified by the, the task name and then you know, the input name. And uh, so these basically get translated over into the DNA Nexus native uh, JSON format. And so you can see this gets compiled into um, a specific stage um, and then you know, it gives, you, gives the file and the associated project ID uh, for that um, input. So let's, die, um, and that's, that's where you can use this inputs argument. Um, additional settings. So because you're running this at the Java level, you do need to pr provide a project ID with this dash dash project argument. Um, so you can uh, basically, uh, this is because like, you know, the DX compiler isn't aware of, uh, you know, the, your current project context. Um, so you need to basically submit that. Um, and then you can give it a destination in your project. And here we're giving it the compiled workflow folder. Um, it, and oftentimes you're going to be doing this multiple times. <laughs> um, you know, I never get this right on the first time. Um, so you might want to use, use this dash dash archive argument. So this will archive the previous workflow and the applets into, a, into the dot archive folder. And it will basically compile the, your, the new version of your applet into this destination folder. So let's talk about what happens when you compile it. Hopefully everything is successful. Um, you'll, what you'll see is that basically you will have kind of the apps. And so you can see there are two kind of steps in our app and we'll be going into depth, further depth of this app um, a little later. Um, but our two stages are called count underscore BAM 
and then slice underscore cram. So these are individual applets. And then this is our workflow, the view and count workflow. So what does that look like um, when you're actually running it? So just to give you an idea. Um, so there is some, some uh, there's actually this common applet that basically does some um, initial processing. But then you can see that these are the individual steps or, or stages or tasks. So this is a slice cram applet and it has um, various inputs. And then it has, uh, here is this, uh, basically the slice, uh, the count, count, um, count BAM applet. So now we've compiled it. So let's talk about actually running it and we'll utilize DX run much like running um, anything on the platform, whether it be an applet or workflow, because it's now a, uh, it's now a native workflow. So when we run, we run DX compiler, we'll, um, a workflow ID will be returned. So we're going to use that um, in our command, but we'll go over these individual parts in, uh, separately. So again, um, this is like this. This is the command that you use to kind of initialize a workflow. Dx run. Um, for our, um, if you have um, your inputs in that input format that we were talking about, um, you need to provide this dash f flag. Um, and one thing to note here is that you don't want to use that uh, initial file that you generated with WAM tools. You want to generate the input file that was generated by DX, uh, that was translated by DX compiler. So you don't want to use the uh, first one from WAM tools, but you need to utilize the one that's translated. Um, you'll follow that with the workflow ID. And then optionally, you can specify things with the destination parameter. Um, and then Hopefully everything works out, works great. And then you, your um, workflow will be run on the platform. And you can see that these are the individual stages of, the, of, the plat of, the, of your workflow. And that's all I have. Um, so now I'm going to hand it off to Anasaja, um, who's going to be talking about Whittle syntax and writing Whittle. So that was uh, telling how you can actually work when you have your Whittle file already created. But I will cover the part and we will continue more in the second part of our uh, two sessions webinar, how you actually can write Whittle and some tips and tricks on that. So um, before we will start to look at the Whittle syntax more detail in, in the more details, I would like to have a kind of comparison be between native and Whittle workflows. So for the native DNA Nexus concept, you have app and the equivalent is task. Then there is a DNA Nexus workflow, which we called also native workflow. And then there is a Whittle workflow. Both uh, app task has, have input and output and also workflows, native and Whittle workflows have inputs and outputs. Then there is a run spec in app and then there is something which is called runtime, and they both can use Docker. And also DNA Nexus native workflow can use run specification for the workflow as a whole. Task for a Whittle part. So now we'll cover what are the different parts of Whittle and why actually you would like to use Whittle. Uh, you can uh, call a task. And there is a nice thing about Whittle, which is uh, scatter gather. So we will cover it in a few slides. And it's that you uh, explicitly can scatter your work into multiple computers and then it's gathered implicitly so you don't have to care about it. And also we have conditionals in order to specify how you can um, customize your task or your workflow, you can use conditionals. And these are the two benefits why you would like to use um, Whittle. Just to summarize what I uh, said before in the in diagram, the task is equivalent to app. So it's software environment and scripts, both. 
And tasks can be executed on a single worker or scattered to multiple workers. And in order for it to be scattered, we will be using scatter function. Workflow contains tasks, inputs, and outputs. And a workflow can call a task. And the output of a task serves as an input to another task. It could be. And a Whittle file consists of single workflow and multiple tasks. So only one workflow could be in a, sing in a Whittle file. And so uh, now I will walk you through our Whittle example. So it's an introductionary toy example that we can walk through to understand some basic concepts and basic syntax of Whittle. So in our case, we'll be transforming crown file into bound file. Then we'll be slicing bound files. So each chromosome will go into a separate file. And for each file containing one chromosome, we'll count number of alignments. In the end, we'll be creating an array of integers where each element represents a number of alignments that were counted in the um, BAM. So what inputs do we have? We'll have crown file. And we are showing you this example with crown file because if you were if you are dispensing data on UKB rack, you will see that whole exome sequencing data are available in crown file format, not in BAM. And because we are using a crown file, we'll also use crown index files. And because we are using crown file, which is actually a file which is um, mapped on a reference, we need to have this reference file and the index reference file. That's why we have this reference FASTA and reference FASTA index. And also there will be one parameter, which is slicing um, for us to slice our crumb into or BAM into multiple BAMs, and it is number of chromosomes, and it will be using 22 in our example. So only this input will have a default value, and we will see in a moment how we can define default value. And the output, as I already mentioned, will be array of um, integers, and each integer mean count of alignments for each chromosome. But before we'll dive in, I just would like to emphasize you know, how you can work with the crown files. So uh, as it's written here is a compressed columnar file format. And it means that it only stores difference between the store sequence and the reference. So this is important to remember. And that's why you need to use correct reference file. So for uh, the whole exome sequencing data, you can use the uh, GRC38 reference file, so the O um, um, FASTA, and by uh, when you get the presentation, you can click and there will be a link to how, where you can download your reference FASTA, or there is a discussion on BioStars, how you can check header in your crime file for some further or future releases, if the reference FASTA will be different. So here is our little example. Here is the workflow part, and here is the part with a, with a task. Again, don't worry, there is a lot of text, a lot of code, and we will go almost line by line to be sure that you understand. So let's start with the workflow itself, and then we'll look into task definition. So we start uh, with a, um, st a stating version. And it's very important because in case you will not state the version, the compiler will be assuming that you're using last version. So it's very important to state the version so you will be sure what, what Whittle specification is used. Then um, when we look at the workflow, we can see that workflow has inputs and we already uh, stated what these inputs are. So here you see that the inputs is optional uh, so, so all of these inputs are not on optional, and this number of the chromosomes is optional, and we're standing is with a, a question mark, but we will talk about it um, in a few slides when we're looking more into Whittle syntax. And also we have here um, an output. Um, in case you are coming from the R or Python background, you might be surprised that Whittle is stating types. So you do not do it usually in Python, for example, but here you need to state it. So here you know that file means file pass, int means integer, and array means array of integers. Then 
there is a body of our workflow where the whole computation actually occurs. So you see that we first call slice cram, and here we are mapping the um, inputs of this task, slice underscore cram, with the variables that we have here as an input for the workflow. By mapping it like that, we can, we can uh, say to Will that we actually are using these uh, inputs into this task. After we call this slice cram, we will go and use a scatter function and we will slice um, we will slice our slices, the output of our scatter cram, slice cram um, function. And for each slice, we will apply count bam function where the count BAM has only one input parameter, which is BAM. And for as a BAM, we'll be using our slice. So just to remind you, the slice in this case means BAM containing elements for one chromosome. Now we can look at our task slice gram. So the first task that we will be using in our workflow. As I was mentioning before, task also has inputs and outputs. So here you can see output and uh, an input specification. And here you can see that the output of the uh, slice underscore crumb um, function is actually the array, of, but not of integers, but of files. And we can find files by using uh, the function globe and the pattern slices slash um, asterisk dot bam. So all of the bam files in slice directory. And where do we get slice directory? Well, we are doing it here. So body of our task is a command part here. And the command part actually is bash part. So here what we are doing inside. So um, the set xeo pi fail is a um, um, it will actually make very good for you that it will make uh, your script fail or your workflow fail immediately in case error occurs. And uh, we uh, put a link here so you can see more about what the specific um, parameters mean. Then we are taking the base name from the file, the cram file, and we're actually in this part. We are um, making from cram file to bam file. Once we're done with a, with a bam file, we're indexing it, we're creating our slices directory, and then we're going chromosome by chromosome, and we're making a bam file out of it. So it's here. Also, the task can have a runtime. And in this example, for the runtime, we're using a pass or a link to the, um, to the Docker environment or Docker image that we'll be using for this uh, case. And in this case, this is a Docker image that, can, that contains some tools. So there is some tools installed there. Here is an example or code of our second task. So just for you to remember first, we slice our cram into bumps, and then for each bump we're counting alignments. So this task has an, as an input, just one BAM file. It's then doing some tools view dash C, which is actually counting alignments on this BAM file. And then it will output the integer, just the single count, which will then gather it into array. So here it's put it in, in all together, so we start by slicing crumb, which we're doing here. And we are, uh, we're having like directory containing multiple BAM files. And then for each BAM file, we're counting alignments here. And we're having as an output integer, which we're gathering here into array. So this is how everything is combined. And um, Ted was showing you this part of this, um, uh, slide when you are compiling your workflow on the platform. And here, I just want to map it all together. So this is the, num the name of the workflow that we're of compiled workflow. Here is an input file. Um, and here is a slice 
cron function. And here we have a, a scatter function. And here is the output. So here is how it mapped together between Whittle workflow and the DNA ne Nexus native workflow. So this was just a brief like, tour on our example. And now we'll dive in a bit about different of, about into different um, Whittle syntax, and we'll continue in our second section. So we will start with the data types. And the data types in Whittle are divided basically on three major categories. So one of them are primitive types. So here, for example, you can see a string, Boolean, integer, float, or file. Or you could have compound data types, such as array, which is a sequence of the same um, data types, primitive, map, which is something like a dictionary in Python, and pair, which is something like a tuple in Python. And then there is also a third uh, class of a data type, and it's called structs, which is user-defined data type. It's more like um, more toward the object-oriented programming that, for example, here you are identifying the data type person, and here you are saying what are, will be the different attributes of that person, and then it comes like a key and value. So, for example, here the person has a name, age, and SSH key, and here you can see the instance of that person. So, the name is John, age is 20, and there is a pass to SSH key. And for that, we're using struct keyword. And just, uh, I forgot to mention it, that here you will see that uh, there is a documentation link which will point you specifically in that place in documentation which is covering this specific part. So uh, then you can, once you get the presentation, you can go and you can even uh, learn more. So that was about data types. Now let's uh, talk about inputs and outputs. So defining a uh, little output. As I was talking before, the question mark denotes that the input is optional. You don't have to have this input. And look how it's done here. So here is variable age, which is optional, meaning that it has a question mark. And what we are doing here, we're setting the default value by selecting first age or 42. It means that if for that task, the age variable is provided, then the age um, value is taken as actual age. And if age variable is not provided, then the 42 value is used. Also, you can see that there is an interesting plus sign. What does it mean? So it, it means it's for compound data types in case you want your data type to be non-empty, meaning that it should have at least one element. And in this case, it seems that uh, the community really likes a lot of paths because it means that at least one path should be in the array. Also, um, we have an output and with output it's the same, so it could be optional output here. And also there is a glock function and, we're, and we, were, we were showing it before, then it could find uh, file names with wildcard wild card characters. For example, here, the output will be array of files and all of these files would be WCF files. Now let's look at the different parts of the task. So we were talking about task before and we were talking that the, the like core of the, uh, the most important part where the computation occurs is a, uh, most often it's command part. So, a uh, command part is denounced using the keyword command, and you will use these three, uh, three signs like that. And uh, if you are using variables which were defined in Whittle outside of the command block, you're just using normal like this. So it's, um, and if you're using inside the command block, then you need to use tilde and the curly braces. 
And there are variabilities how you can use it, but we are strongly suggesting to use this type of notation because it could help you to distinguish between bash variables and Widdle variables. Uh, also, I would like to, um, when we are calling um, task, we can call it by aliasing it. So for example, here we have um, uh, align cram task, and we can use it in a kind of non-traditional way that we can um, call this task two times but with a different names. And this will help us to distinguish. So for example, here we have a, a, a line tumor and a line germline. And here you can see that it's then will uh, distinguish the input files here. So you know that if it's a line tumor, you will need to, to have to provide crown file for tumor tissue and the germline you need to provide for uh, germline tissue. And you can use it uh, using keyword as. Then uh, there is also how we can call a task. There is a scatter function and we were actually using it before. And this is here is example from our from the code that we were showing before. So we are using scatter. Then there is a our uh, element, the, 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 the iteration that we'll be doing. So we have a slices and we'll be iterating. So uh, the variable that will be changing is slice. And for each of the slice, we'll be applying count cram task. And as it said, the outputs are gathered implicitly into array. Uh, the uh, other uh, advantage that we were talking before was conditionals. And here is a like, small example how you can use conditionals. So currently only if block exists and um, you can customize your, um, your task by using conditionals. So for example, here you have some workflow which is preprocess and you have task input. So uh, in preprocess and you have a, a task uh, align. And for align, in case the run QC is true, then you will be doing QC or quality control. In case it will be false, then the uh, then this code block is skipped. So we we talk about tasks, we talk about uh, scatter, gather, and conditionals, and now we would like to talk about the runtime. So the runtime is kind of equivalent of a run spec in case you were. Uh, attending our apps and workflows uh, webinars in uh, in the end of uh, 2021. So uh, here is an example which is specifically for um, UKB RAP or for the Indian Access platform, is that there is a keyword dx underscore instance underscore type. And here you can fill in uh, the instance type based on what is available in, um, in that region. Or there is some general specification is that, uh, or what you can also add is Docker keyword. So um, pass to the Docker, CPU, memory disk, and also more. So we advise you to look both on the documentation in DX compiler and open a Widdle to see all of the keywords that are presented here and that you can use to specify your runtime for your task. Um, so yeah, so here it's, that's what, what I was uh, telling you about. Here is an example of the X compiler, BWA. So you can look and you can see what, what are the um, runtime, how it's specified. Um, yeah, and also there is some specific uh, keyword for the instance type. So now I would like to talk about two different um, meta parts which are parts that are uh, not interpreted by the uh, compiler, but it's for the human reader to make it more understandable to know some details about the, your code, either for your coworkers or for yourself in a few months after you wrote it. So meta part can be part of task or workflow. And as I said, it's only of interest to human readers. So for example, here uh, we were showing that Ted created this code. So there is a meta block 
with a keyboard meta, and then there is a keyboard author and email, the specification here. Parameter meta is kind of similar, but it's more specified because it could help you to document your function. So um, again, it's, it can be part of task or workflow, and it's only for human reader. But the important thing here is that if we are doing the parameter underscore meta for the some task, the um, keywords that we have here must, uh, must be present in the input or output. So there must correspond to input or output. For example, here we have an in file, and that's why we have in file lines only or region. And you can help your users or yourself or your coworkers to add parameter meta and to um, add help messages to your uh, Widdle workflow. So I think that we're almost at the end. So we'll have a few minutes to ask questions, but let me just summarize it. So where to get help for Widdle? So we advise you to go to UKB uh, RAP community to ask DNA Nexus people and another users um, about the questions if you are um, have with UKB RAP. Or you can uh, check the following GitHub pages like Open Widdle or the X Compiler Expert options. Or for feature requests, you can see you can consider submitting a ticket at the X Compiler, and there is a link how you can specifically showing or um, instructing you how you can do that. And also you can look, you look at GATK forums. Also a few links about our community. There is a quick start on our documentation community forum. You can uh, join our newsletter. And uh, I think that till the next session, we also will be posting the code of our apps up to our, um, our GitHub repository where you can find also material for the other webinar that we already had. Um, okay, so I think that we have uh, now time for a few questions. Uh, sure, so there are a lot of great questions that were asked, um, especially about NextFlow. Um, so what, just to clarify, um, when you are running um, NextFlow in a single instance, you do not need to you um, you do not need to have a license. It is when you want to use multiple workers with Nextflow that you need to have the license. Um, and uh, Riva actually um, noted that if you want to know about more about the licensing process, to email support um, at dnanexus.com. Um, let's see. Uh, in the meantime, I can answer. There is a question that. Um... Uh, that uh, presenting a real life use case on UKB def data that uh, would make uh, that um, Elena is uh, telling that this would be a better user experience. So we can consider it. It's actually something that we were discussing a lot with Ted. Uh, the only thing that we would like to provide you reasoning why we decided to have this toy example and why we're actually uh, most of the time deciding to have a toy example in case we have this webinar settings is that um, we need to have something which is like easily understandable for the audience that we have, and then we can walk through the syntax. So the thing here, and for example, we were doing that on a GBAS webinar when the focus was to perform a GBAS analysis. And there was a lot of heavy code really connecting to how you can actually analyze your data and perform GBAS with Regini. And we're actually suggesting you to look at our webinar. But in this case, the focus was to show Widdle with examples. And that's why we decided to, to do it like more understandable. So maybe if you can add to that, Ted. Uh, yeah. Um... Yeah, so uh, what Anasa just said, <laughs> I don't have anything to add, sorry. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I don't know if uh, you want to comment some other questions. Uh, so there was a question about, you know, using like a Docker reference to a, a Docker a, a Docker link versus using a Docker image. Um, we will cover this in the next session. 
but yes, one thing to keep in mind is if you have if you can save basically your Docker container as a Docker image on the platform that will actually speed up reuse um, and you won't run it with across the limits of having a limited number of Docker pulls. Uh, but we will definitely cover that more in the next session. So Alex is asking, can I bring a workflow from a private repository? So in case it's your workflow, your little workflow, you can just download it locally to your com computer. You download the X compiler, you compile it, and then you can use it uh, in, in a DNA, in, in a UKB wrap as a native workflow. So yes, you can use it. 